everyone. I am still seeing a lot of our attendees logging on, but in terms of interest of time, I figure I'll get going with the introduction statements of today's webinar so that we can have as much time as possible for our keynote speaker and our panelists today. Um, welcome everyone to this first webinar in the WFAD and Carlton Hall Consulting Prevention Series. My name is Regina Matson and I represent WFAD. We are a multilateral community of NGOs and individuals. And with over two, 320 member organizations in 60 countries, we join hands in strengthening prevention, increasing access to treatment and promoting recovery. So this prevention series is a joint effort between ourselves and Carlton Hall Consulting LCC. And we will cover various topics once every two weeks from today and up until November with support from fantastic speakers from across the globe. We've had the great pleasure of working together with Carlton Hall to organize a series that ensures that not only different topics within the field of prevention are highlighted, but also to ensure that voices from various regions are heard throughout these five webinars. Today, we are excited to have us with you, have you with us on this first webinar in the prevention series, where we will start off by highlighting the foundation of prevention through prevention science. So to go quickly through the agenda, we will start off today with our keynote speaker who will speak for about 35 minutes, leading us into uh, a panel that will take up the rest of the time. We will ensure that this is an interactive webinar and not only having your questions be answered, but also to provide time for you to share your own expertise on the topic. And we ask you to do so uh, by introducing yourselves in the chat box and sharing your experiences. There's also a Q&A box that will be open for your questions. You can ask them anonymously or with your name, and you can even raise your virtual hand and we can ensure that you can speak and uh, say your question out loud. So right now we would like to ensure that we have time not only to hear our panelists, but to ensure that we can answer all the questions that come in. So we will ask you to bear with us and extend today's session with about 15 minutes at the very end. And we hope you can stay on for this. So before we get started, I have the great pleasure to introduce today's speakers and we'll go through them one by one before our keynote takes the stage. So first of all, I see that my colleague Cressida is changing the screen. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Silly Sloboda is the president of Applied Prevention Science International. She was trained in medical sociology at New York University and in mental health and epidemiology at the John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Sloboda worked for 12 years at the National Institute on Drug Abuse in severe capac several capacities, finally as the Director of the Division of Epidemiology and Prevention Research. Dr. Zilli is an expert on the prevention of substance use and has broad experience in research related to at-risk youth and to the evaluation of treatment and prevention programs. Dr. Zilli Will uh, was the founder of both the Society for, for Prevention Research in both the US and the EU, and has published, published broadly in the field of substance use epidemiology and prevention. And I'm sure that a lot of you who are here today have heard or come across Dr. Silly within your various work, not only through research, but also through applied prevention. So we're very honored to have Dr. Silly with us today to set the tone, not only for today's webinar, for, but for the entire series. Our next speaker and our dear friend and co-organizer of this series is Carlton Hall. Carlton is the president and CEO of Carlton Hall Consulting LCC, LLC, a multifaceted full service consulting firm decided to provide customized solutions and enable measurable change for communities, organizations, families, and individuals. Carlton has been providing intense substance abuse prevention focused and focused and community problem solving services to the nation for the last 25 years. He spent 12 years with the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, serving in several leadership positions and including most recently acting vice president, training operations and acting director for CADCA's National Coalition Institute. We can look forward to Carlton identifying the importance, importance and recognizing vulnerability and how it plays into what we should be considering in prevention and seeing communities here as a building block. Uh, our next speaker is Chantelle Pepper, who with close to a decade of experience in the field of substance 
abuse with focus on demand, prevention and aftercare and reintegration, supply and harm reduction. It's working closely with provincial departments, local governments and municipalities and civil society in South Africa. In May 2018, Chantal was appointed as the chair for the Provincial Substance Abuse Forum, where she drives and manages the P PSAF and local drug action committees to ensure that the national drug master plan is implemented within the Western Cape through a transversal and co collaborative approach. Chantal will be focusing today on the real gaps within implementation policy and legislation and working ground level up and also the gap in understanding what prevention science is in her setting. Last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Matej Kosil, who is the director of the Institute for Research and Development. He has been working in prevention and advocacy in the field of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs for more than 21 years. He's the author, co-author, and reviewer of scientific articles and evaluator of European projects in the field of health and research. In Slovenia, he has been leading in the network prevention preventive platform for over 10 years, in which over 40 different, mostly non-governmental institutions and organizations actively participate and support. He is a PhD student in preventive science at the Faculty of Education and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Zagreb. He's the vice president of the International Confederation of Research Associations in the field of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and deputy chairperson of the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs. We can look forward to Matej's additions in focusing on the gap between science and practice as the biggest obstacle for all of our work. So with these presentations of our extraordinary speakers for today, and without further ado, I have the pleasure of welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Sili Sloboda, to take the online stage and lead us into today's webinar. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's, it's great to see some familiar faces <laughs> and familiar names. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, building the foundations of prevention through prevention science. And I'm going to be trying to cover um, what we have learned, what we have, how much we've achieved over the past 30 years in 35 minutes. So this is going to be a tough one for me. Um, next slide, please. I would like to uh, acknowledge my longtime colleague and friend, Susan David, who helped me put this presentation together. Um, next slide. So what I'm hoping to cover today is, as I said, to talk about the 30-year evolution of prevention science and its application to evidence-based interventions and policies. I'm going to be talking about the importance of professionalizing the field of prevention practice through building the capacity of prevention professionals worldwide um, and how far we have come to achieving this goal, um, but we still have a long way to go. But I think pieces are in place and we'll, I'll talk to some, to uh, talk about that a little bit. And then also many of us are feeling that there's a need to have service delivery systems in place. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about um, what the components for building a national service delivery system that needs to be in place to implement and sustain evidence-based evidence prevention programming. While at the same, same time, and I think this is a new, a new concept to the field, uh, and that is while we're building a culture of prevention. Next slide. So what is the evolution of prevention science? Next slide. Uh, the primary goal of prevention science is to improve public health by identifying malleable factors, risk and protective factors, um, assessing the efficacy and effectiveness of preventive interventions and identifying optimal means for dissemination and diffusion. Um, I think that um, part of this evolutionary process has been the development of the, um, you, the and I'll talk a little bit about that, the Societies for Prevention Research, both in the United States and, and in Europe, but also there are uh, small groups uh, rising in many places around the world. Uh, in, in this, we've talked about the science of prevention for uh, a while, but it was on, not until 2011 that the United States Society for Prevention Research actually used the information 
uh, and experience that we've had to develop a document that lays out this field of prevention science. And that um, if you go to the SPR website, you can, you can find that document. I think you'll find it quite interesting. Um, what, what the Society of Prevention Research decided was that the field involves a study of human development, social ecology, as well as the identification, as I said, of factors and processes. The processes, I think, are really important to us in prevention. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, that lead to positive and negative health outcomes. One of the challenges we had, I was part of that group to develop the document was defining prevention science. And the fact that prevention science is multidisciplinary was a bit challenging at the time, um, but I think that's the richness uh, of, of our field of prevention. Um, next slide. The focus, as I said, of prevention science is threefold to identify those factors that put people at risk or who, who uh, protect them or reinforce positive um, factors that are associated with positive behaviors, particularly focusing on and risky behaviors, health risk behaviors, um, explaining how these factors operate through theories and models. That's really important for us to understand that. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then this was really the big challenge, I think, for the field was um, how to evaluate prevention programs. And I think we owe a great deal to our statistical methodologists uh, for the progress that we've made in the field in terms of evidence-based uh, interventions. Uh, next slide. So prevention science reflects both research and practice. And it's multidisciplinary, as I mentioned. And therefore, if you look at any of the research that's done in the field, you'll notice that it usually involves a transdisciplinary team um, that make it more comprehensive and meaningful for um, prevention practice practitioners particularly so that you understand what happened during the intervention why it worked i think that's really important for us uh, next slide so how do we put science to work for prevention so these sciences help us in in many ways uh, first of all epidemiology um, sometimes when i talk to to practitioners about epidemiology, that it, not even practitioners, even my colleagues who are prevention researchers, um, they, they feel a little overwhelmed. But really what's really important is that epidemiology really describes what the problem is. Um, and understanding that problem and understanding who's involved and what the, what the etiologic factors, what are the causes, and what also what are the consequences of the problem are really helpful for us in designing not only designing prevention interventions, but for practitioners to decide which is the best intervention to use for that particular population. Um, having prevention definitions and principles in place um, that explain uh, behaviors and, and how we can intervene to interrupt the trajectory towards negative behaviors like substance use is also extremely important for us to understand as part of science. Um, next slide. It's also um, important for us to, to not necessarily be methodologists, but for prevention practitioners to understand what methods are used to demonstrate how evidence-based prevention interventions and policies are shown to be effective. Because then that, they become your, your spokesperson for, for prevention science and for, um, particularly in community situations, um, if they're part of a community, coalition and they have to work with other groups and convincing other groups of what, what, why it's important to implement this particular intervention as opposed to another intervention. And of course, um, being a researcher, I think monitoring and evaluation approaches also are very helpful for us to understand. Um, are, we, if, are we reaching the right populations? If we don't collect information and monitor the process, how do we know we're reaching the right populations? How do we know we're getting the outcomes that we need? Uh, for this population. So I think that's also very important. Um, next slide. So that's the science part, but 
be also the the skills and competency part is the other part of being a, an effective prevention professional. And having these skills, I think, is, is very important for the field. We need to have be able to communicate um, why we're selecting particular populations. We need to advocate for prevention. Uh, we need to have skills in terms of how do you select these, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and have some knowledge about planning, implementing, and monitoring evaluation. And of course, very important is understanding uh, ethical principles regarding prevention programming. Next slide. So what is this evolution of prevention science? Um, so the field, is, as you can say, has come a long way in the past 30 years. The Society for Prevention Research was established in the United States in 1991. And we established it as a place where prevention researchers could come together to share their research and their expertise. Interestingly, the term science of prevention first appeared in print in 1993. Uh, in 2010, the European Union Society for Prevention Research was established and other similar groups, as I said, have been evolving in other parts of the world, including Australia and Brazil. However, it wasn't, as I said, until 2011 that the, United, that the US Society for Prevention Research actually put the standards of knowledge for prevention science in, on paper. Uh, and it was accepted by by the Complete Society, as well as the European Society for Prevention Research. The, in, next slide, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, more recently, we have the European Drug Prevention Quality Standards. They were published by the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction in 2011. And this document is really a very significant piece of our toolkit, if you will, uh, for prevention. And this lays out the skills and competencies for prevention professionals. In addition to that, in 2013, the International Standards on Drug Use Prevention were published. Uh, this was prepared by the U United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes and the World Health Organization has been updated in, in 2018. And we're hoping to be have it updating periodically. Um, and then interestingly, even though we talked about, um, could you go back? If, if, if though we went back, we, we talked about, we used the term in 1993, science of prevention. It wasn't until 2019 that we actually started defining this term. Um, and this definition is by the National Prevention Science Coalition in the United States and, and our group, Applied Prevention Science International. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So to achieve, to truly achieve adulthood in the field of science, it's not enough to have a definition. Prevention science must be embraced internationally, not only by prevention professionals, but also the academic community, as well as by policymakers and the general public. And I, I think our panel after this talk will be talking more about that. So let's now turn to the next slide, turn to professionalize and prevention practice. And what does this mean? Next slide. If uh, we look at the sociology professions, um, there have been a number of people have written about what, what, what makes a profession. So part of being a profession is having a systematic body of theory, knowledge, skills, and competencies, having the authority to define the problems that they're addressing and their treatment, having community sanctions in place to admit and train its members, to have an ethical code in place that stress the ideal uh, of service to others, and a culture that includes the institutions necessary to carry out the functions of that profession. So where are we in this uh, list? Uh, how do we match pre prevention against this list in the, in the sense of establishing a profession? So next slide, what do we have in place? So we can see that we have a systematic body of theory. We have the standards. Uh, we have the European drug quality standards. We have the international standards and we, we have 
uh, we, we are, we have uh, APSI, my group has worked with uh, other groups to develop the universal prevention curriculum. And we've actually updated that curriculum now and we uh, made it virtual. Uh, so we can do this on Zoom like we're doing today. Uh, next slide. What about the authority to define our problems in, in their treatment? And that funny question mark was because we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, although we have a definition of, prevent, of the problem um, and we have all these tools that we can look to for those, um, it's not, these have not, as I said, been universally accepted. Um, we do have we do have evidence based <coughs> prevention interventions and policies. We have the standards. We also now have a number of, of really good registries that we can go to uh, to look for our interventions that we <coughs> evidence based interventions, um, and both here in the United States with blueprints and in Europe um, with the EMCDDA portal. Uh, next slide. And. We're, we're having community sanctions in place and training its members. We don't have a standardized training across the globe. Uh, we don't have a central credentialing and licensing organizations, but we're, we're, we're getting there. We do have these important pieces in place. So we're getting there. And then finally, last slide, um, we do have, um, uh, ethical codes that stress an ideal to service through the prevention think tank and the European drug prevention quality standards. And finally, um, I, meant, I, I mentioned the culture of prevention, and this includes institutions necessary to carry out its functions. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit, let's go into a little bit more detail about what we have in place. I just wanna show, show some of this to you because I know from my experience in training prevention professionals around the world, that not everybody's as familiar with these as, as we'd like them to be. Uh, next slide. So you may have seen variations of this, of this uh, model that serves as a guide to prevention professionals showing what the skills they need, what the processes are in terms of putting uh, intervention, evidence-based interventions in place. And this model is an adaptation um, from the European Drug Prevention Quality Standards. And it's important because it reminds us of what prevention professionals need to do to help prevent, prevent substance use in their communities. They need to be doing a needs assessment. That's where epidemiology comes in place, selecting interventions, preparing and imp for implementation of the interventions um, all across the whole system to, to monitor what's going on. And then finally to do some evaluations and they don't have to be rigorous randomized controlled trials. Um, but just to, to see, are you getting the short-term, at least the short-term outcomes that you need to have from the intervention? Because if you achieve those short-term outcomes, the likelihood of achieving the long-term out outcome of impacted substance use is, is going to be, is going to happen. Uh, next slide. So you can see how the science, prevention science on the left in this scheme, schemata, epidemiology intervention development and research methods, how this aligned with the prevention tasks uh, of the prevention professional, and then the role of the prevention professional in terms of making things happen in the community. Um, next slide, please. One of the important things is understanding vulnerability and in the process of prevention. So let's talk a little bit about vulnerability because um, by understanding vulnerability, if what happens to uh, drive people to, to young people to uh, in, in, engage and in, involve with uh, psychoactive substances and understanding that process helps us understand how we can prevent it. So next slide. This is a, a model that sort of simplifies um, a very complex process. And what this model shows is the importance of the interaction between the individual 
us, our genetic makeup, our temperament, our, our, our physiology, how that plays out and interacts with our microenvironment. That includes our family, our schools, peers, faith-based organizations, workplace, as well as uh, how we're influenced by the macro level environments. So that'd be socioeconomic uh, environment, the social, cultural, and the physical environment. And I, I added climate change to this because there's a, a group now that's become quite interested in an international group that's looking at the relationship between prevention and climate change. And we could probably add a whole bunch of other things to this, but um, it's important for us to understand what those, what those influences are, and not only on the individual, but also on the micro level and impact on my, on the on the macro level and vice versa. And then of course, what these interactions do, they shape our attitudes, our beliefs, our norms, and that ultimately shapes our behaviors. This whole process is a socialization process. And I think this is a new term that's been introduced in the field in the last 10 years, perhaps. Um, but I think it's a very useful term. I want to also point out that we're moving up. This, this, this drills deeper in terms of looking at causality rather than looking at risk and protective factors. Risk and protective factors are indicators of the process, but really don't get into what's happening because we really need to understand that process. I see Carlton's clapping his hands. <laughs> and so if you think about risk and protective factors, think about the interface between the micro level and the personal factors, that's, that's where you have protection or, or putting somebody at risk in between the macro, et cetera. The, it's the interface between these that really is a risk and protective. And um, I think that we need to develop better tools um, to really identify those vulnerability factors. Um, next slide, please. So many of you probably are familiar with uh, socialization. Um, we, we, talk, we just talked about the influences our socialization agents. Um, you know, we're, we're not born with a culture. Um, we have to learn as we go along <laughs> how, to, how to, uh, to interact with our environments. Uh, of course, our parents are probably the most crucial um, socialization agent we have, uh, but then we go to schools and there's, a whole, there's socialization processes go on in schools, etc. even in the workplace. And, and um, for those who are, are older, our grandchildren <laughs> are, are also socializing us in many ways um, to, to what's happening um, in, in our lives uh, currently. So this is a process, as I said, that's a lifelong process. It's a very, very important process. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, so one of the, the, maybe I should have put this slide first, but I, it's always hard to know which goes first. But anyway, thinking about it from a socialization process point of view, then you, we can identify points for intervention. So we can, I put uh, stars here where there are particular points for intervention between uh, where you can intervene be for, with families, um, we can intervene um, hopefully in the physical environment, for instance, um, but also um, to directly interface with, with an individual, say in a classroom or in some kind of a setting where you can intervene uh, in the process of, of, uh, of preventing uh, prevention process. Um, next slide. I think this is really important because if you think about socialization, you think about vulnerability, then prevention becomes a socialization process. And the primary focus of preventive interventions is on individual decision making with respect to socially appropriate and healthy behaviors. So keep that in mind. Um, next slide. So, um, both socialization and prevention programming sh share similar processes. They both use evidence-based practices to help individuals interpret cues in their environment. Um, they help individuals learn and practice new behaviors, such as how to resist offers to use substances. And they help individuals weigh the potential outcomes for the performance of these behaviors within their own social and emotional contexts. 
So just to explain what this means, in positive socialization, parents or caretakers use appropriate parenting skills. They help their children understand the right and wrong behaviors of their society. They support uh, pro-social attitudes and behaviors. Uh, teachers help students take on the role of a student and to be successful in the classroom and encourage learning and working with others. Uh, we could go on and on about that. So when prevention interventions address children and adolescents directly, um, let me step back a bit. So prevention professionals work with, with parents and families to improve their socialization skills, to make it more positive experience for the child. If you, uh, for those of you who know, for instance, the good behavior game, that program trains teachers to be to do their to be better socialization agents and helping the student adjust to to being a student that taking on that role successfully. In addition, as I said, uh, prevention professionals when they're conducting an intervention, say a school-based curriculum, they are actually socializing the students directly to help them make sound decisions about, in our case, the use of substances. I think that that's where I see the linkage, and I think that's uh, understanding the process that are involved in, 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 in um, about uh, engaging in behavior of uh, substance use, for instance, uh, and the socialization process. You can see that there's a great deal of overlap there. So next slide. So prevention professionals may either train key socialization agents as school, such as parents or teachers, um, or they can, uh, next slide, directly engage. So I think these are really important that prevention professionals have this dual role. Next slide. So how do we translate these processes that we're talking about um, it to evidence-based interventions? and policies. Next slide. We're just at the 10 minute mark now. Sorry okay. To <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we're very fortunate to have the international standards. Um, next slide. Um, the intent of the standards is to summarize the scientific evidence um, that we had uh, to date and to describe uh, effective interventions and policies to identify the major components and features uh, of a national substance use prevention system and ultimately to help policymakers worldwide support evidence-based programs and policies and systems. Um, next slide. Um, I'm going to go through this part a little bit more quickly. Um, I hope um, I should have put the um, website uh, for the international standards. Um, I don't know if we can do that in the chat. Somebody can put that in um, because I think it's really important. That I, what I've done in the next couple of slides is sort of made charts of what you will find in the standards and not ex this isn't what it's gonna look like. Um, but what's important about the standards is that they're looking at it from a developmental framework. So you have, uh, you're looking at the uh, infancy to early childhood, middle childhood, early adolescence, and adolescence and adulthood. So looking at what's available um, for those particular age groups. Uh, in different settings, family, school, workplace, community, there, we also have health, uh, although we don't have much in the health uh, area. And then looking at the target populations, the universal selected and indicated, which is related to the risk status of the target group. Uh, next slide. Um, so what's included in the standards document um, for each intervention policy, there's a short description and rationale for the intervention, a summary of the evidence, and a list of the characteristics uh, that can be found in, um, in that intervention, um, particularly those that are related to positive outcomes, but also the literature has indicated where there's been negative outcomes or no outcomes whatsoever. Um, next, oh, it also has uh, tools, resources, lots of appendices that are attached to the international standards and they're, they're worth looking at. Um, and then there's a chapter in the standards on critical components of a national drug control system. Next slide. 
Um, so we, here's a sort of a, a summary. This actually is part of the standard, uh, the summary, and you can see across the top are the various age development age groups and along the side are the different settings. Um, there's, there are no specific named programs that are listed here. There are types of programs, types of strategies that are used. So you, for, for uh, early, uh, for prenatal infancies, a prenatal infancy and visitation, many of you are familiar with the nurse practice practitioner of family practice um, intervention. There are interventions uh, for, for parenting skills. Um, for school, we have early childhood education, as well as a personal and social skills, et cetera. So you can see it, the different interventions, the stars indicate the strength of the evidence for the intervention, for that approach, for the strategy. Um, and the color of the boxes have to do with the target population, the green being universal, um, yellow being uh, selective, and red being indicated. Um, I was going to, next slide, I was going to show you uh, how that plays out with middle childhood um, as an example, and I'll, I may go quickly through this. The um, standards, next slide, talks about the developmental goals. Uh, for this particular age group, and you can see them listed out. Um, it also, in the next slide, uh, we, it points out where there are um, not only resiliency factors, but also what are the factors that put the child at risk? What are the vulnerability factors uh, that play a role uh, in, in, in maybe, uh, in, in, particularly for this age group, it's really important because as we know, there's a cumulative effect. So if something happens at this point to throw the child off of a, a positive trajectory, um, they're, they're going to have problems in school, they're going to have problems with their peers, and they're going to have problems as they enter adolescence. Um, next slide. So what, what's in the strat, what's in the in the guideline, the standards is uh, the types of interventions, the strategies, the parenting skills programs, um, personal and social skills education, which generally are in school, um, classroom environmental improvement programs such as good behavior games, and uh, important in policies to keep children in school. And you can see that there are the the risk uh, that are targeted level of risk the population. Next slide. Here's a summary of the kinds of things you're going to find in the standards related to specific strategies. I selected parenting skills for this age group, and you can see the content that's generally involved in these programs that seems to be, uh, that is related to positive outcomes, um, providing these skills to, to families. And they're enhancing family bonding, which is positive family bonding, which is, we know is a strong protective factor. But it also, as you see on the, on the right column, that um, these, these, these tactics, these strategies um, aren't, do not have positive outcomes. They have negative outcomes. And that is just providing information about drugs as we've seen so many programs of that over the years. And also programs that undermine parents' authority. So this has to do with the content. Next slide is the structure of the program. It's really important because parenting programs have specific structures that are very, um, they're designed by the developer to enhance the learning process. Um, and um, these are very interactive, highly interactive. Generally it's parents alone, children, and then combining the groups together. So you may have three different sessions going on uh, in, in a program. Um, on the right again, what was had negative outcomes where you exclusively focus on the child and not the family. Um, and if you lecture, like I'm doing now, <laughs> um, also the delivery is really important. Uh, and consistently, you'll see across the board all these all these uh, strategies really need trained instructors. Um, so the poor outcomes are, have to do with poorly trained instructors. We won't get into fidelity of implementation. That's a whole other <laughs> topic that would take hours to talk about. Okay, uh, next slide, please. But I'd like to point out that these are, these are like ingredients in a recipe. And like a well-made cake, all of the components or ingredients must be in place 
to have an effective intervention. And I think that's where the registries are a nice complement to the international standards because you're look, if you're looking for a program that put these ingredients together, a cake recipe, if you will, um, these, the registries have those, those ingredients. Um, our big challenges, and this is really what I want to focus on and I, quickly, is, is getting, next slide, um, next slide please, is are the challenges is the knowledge gaps um, that we have to address, you know, is, is getting evidence-based prevention to those who need them. And here's a list, and you could probably add the challenges to, to this list. I, I think this is a nice list that Jenna Hausman put together. Um, but there's are the challenges we have. These are the barriers that we have um, to overcome. The another challenge I think may be easier to overcome is the next slide. And that is who are the workers on the ground? Who are the prevention workers? We, we know that there are a large group of self who people self identify as prevention professionals, but even those people have diverse educational levels and focus of interest. Ooh, um, we can. <laughs> okay. um, they also have diverse prevention experiences. Um, but then there's, there's a large population of those who don't self identify as prevention professionals, but they're doing prevention related work. And we know that the social workers, psychologists, family workers, and even teachers who do that. So we need a variety of methods to reach and to train these prevention pr workers because we would really like to have uh, prevention professionals have the same knowledge and share uh, the same kinds of training. That's why the credentialing is really important. Um, there are challenges, uh, next slide. Is We're at we two minutes now, Dr. C. <laughs> okay, um, we need to uh, reach out and be inclusive. We have all these uh, groups in place, and that includes the World Federation Against Drug, uh, to uh, to uh, to adopt uh, prevention science and and bring it to prevention professionals worldwide. Uh, next slide. So maybe having a prevention service delivery system in place will be important. Um, to achieve some of our goals. Um, I mentioned that the standards has a national delivery system um, that's described in that. Uh, I've been working off of that. Uh, there are a number of us in the field that are, are talking about prevention service delivery systems. And um, next slide, we have uh, what the components would be of that. Um, it would it have to be multiple levels. It have to integrate existing systems. We talked about prevention professionals who are working in different delivery systems like healthcare. Um, it would include regulatory services. Next slide. I'm really going through this quickly. <laughs> um, uh, we, um, the institutions that need to be involved, we talked about family, school, workplace, all those environments need to be involved. Next slide. There needs to be a system of trained professionals. There needs to be credentialing as well as training, uh, a uniform training system. And then, of course, we need to have a local, state, and, uh, and national uh, monitoring and evaluation system. And of course, we have to have a funding system in place. Next slide. And this is how I sort of conceive this <laughs> as a graphic. I like to think in graphics terms. It's, it's, it's complex, but um, it's a feedback system. And I'd be happy to, to share, if we're sharing slides, be happy to share this. Um, I'd love to get some feedback. Um, very much uh, interested in that, um, on and building the system. Uh, I, I know here in the United States, we're, trying, we're talking a lot about that. Um, finally, Perhaps last but not least is building uh, a, a, the last slide, a culture of prevention. Um, and we need to have these delivery systems built within a culture of prevention. And what does that mean? And find the key aspects of a culture of prevention, I think is, is shown in the next slide, which would be having the common understanding of the etiology, understanding the processes involved, strong belief in evidence-based prevention works and having support for prevention efforts in a variety of settings uh, and around a variety of issues because what we're learning from our substance use prevention uh, programming is that it has other, has achieves other outcomes as well as just substance use in terms of violence, 
um, dropping academic failure, et cetera. So I think that's important. You get more for your money, <laughs> if you will, for policymakers. Uh, finally, um, at the bottom of the slide, um, this, I, I, Susan, David, and I wrote a commentary on the cultural prevention. There's uh, a source for that. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm looking forward to our panel discussion and to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Silly, for so brilliantly leading us into today's topic. Uh, before we go into our panel, we received quite a few questions for you. So I thought I'd just ask two of them and then we can save the rest of them for, for the Q&A session. And I, would you like, or would you prefer me saying, asking them both at the same time or one by one? <laughs> Um, both is, both are they related? Are, <laughs> are they they are sort of related. Well, okay. it depends on how you see it. But the first question is from Britt uh, Fredenman, and she asks if uh, or is there anything you would say is a difference between girls and boys when it comes to the result of prevention programming? And the second question that I'd like to take now as well is is from Irina who asks, is prevention science currently included in any academic programs, curriculum for health science or public health? Okay, great, great questions. First question is, I hate, there's, there's been very little work in terms of, uh, I feel, uh, about gender differences in response to uh, prevention interventions. And uh, there really needs to be much more research. There needs to be more research in prevention in general. The research is, is really wind down. Um, if you look at the literature, the current research, um, we're really not going where we need to go. And that's one of the things that I, I'm, I would really love to have a group get together and we should develop a research agenda, an international research agenda. I think it's really important. Um, so that's a really wonderful question. Um, we, we know from other research that there is a gender difference in response to the interventions. Um, so thank you for that question. And let's put that as number one on our research agenda. Um, the second uh, question had to do with about prevention science. Um, yes, uh, indeed, prevention science is integrating, is being integrated into a formal academic uh, at the university level. Certainly, um, I know here in the United States, there are offering uh, master's and doctoral de de degrees in prevention science. In fact, I'm in Ohio, Kent State University and their College of Public Health has a, a doctoral program. I'm mentoring a student through that program right now. Um, and uh, across the country, there are uh, universities offering it. I know certainly in Europe, that is indeed the case, and perhaps Matish could talk a little bit about that. Um, but certainly I know that Charles University in Prague has a bachelor's, uh, master's and doctoral program that actually uses the, um, is shaped by the universal prevention curriculum. Um, and this is, I think their second year, <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, so yes, there are programs around the world um, that you can access. I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much. And thank you again for being with here with us here today. Uh, we will now start our process of or our process, our part of the panelists sharing your expertise and views. And to begin, I would like to ask you all the broad question. What would you like to add to the topic based off of your experience, role and perspective? And we will give each of the panelists about 10 minutes and then we will open up for questions and make sure that we answer all the questions that have come in as well. Uh, I would like to ask Matej to take the stage now to share with us your experience. Happy yeah, to have you here. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad and proud to be part of this uh, important prevention uh, group. And um, I have been involved in building or uh, bridging this gap between, between prevention, science and practice uh, almost all my career. So... Um, and this build, this bridge is still not built. Uh, so this, there are still a lot of holes and gaps uh, in between. So there is a lot of work for us in the future. Definitely, we are not uh, yet there where we want to be. And there are se several questions I want to um, I want to include in our discussion. 
uh, important issues uh, regarding this, bridging this gap between science and practice. We know pretty much well, also from international standards and also from other uh, publications and scientific work, uh, what is very likely ineffective or even harmful in prevention. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves, is it ethical to continue with that kind of interventions? And who is responsible for stopping this, well, for this disinvestment from these ineffective and harmful practices? So I think this is the most important part, not doing harm to children, adolescents, and also to adults. So I, I would, uh, I'm, pretty sure that this is the most important uh, question in, in our work. So we have to disinvest from ineffective and harmful practices and convince, persuade policy and decision makers to invest in evidence-based uh, interventions. And this is the hardest, the hardest part of, uh, of the work. So we, we need to have very good knowledge and skills on advocacy, how to persuade and convince policy and decision makers to discuss, start discussing about it, to putting on a, politi a political agenda, then start drafting some strategic uh, policy documents, legislation maybe, and start with funding and implementation of evidence-based practices. This is the hardest part. And uh, uh, from, from my, my own uh, practical experience, I, I, I have to say. And also sometimes I have feeling, oh, in, not only in my country, but also at the international level, that we are focusing too much on very small extent of risk behaviors or problems like substance use or maybe mental health, etc. But there is a much broader spectrum and framework which we have to discuss about in prevention uh, science and practice. And according to the recent uh, NASM report, uh, NASM is, for those who don't know about it, uh, it's National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in the United States. And uh, they actually repeated or emphasized the framework, uh, the, uh, which is based on definition of O'Donnell's uh, about optimal health. So optimal health is a balance between physical health, emotional health, social health, spiritual, spiritual health, and intellectual health. So all five dimensions are important while we are discussing about evidence-based prevention. So we have to uh, broad, uh, to make it much broader discussion on, on prevention uh, from scientific point of view and also from practical point of view. So this is, I would say, a new paradigm discussing about prevention in the future. So set, this set a good starting points for us uh, to, to discuss about future of prevention. Uh, and then Zili already mentioned the importance of education and training of prevention workforce, extremely important because the level of knowledge is very different. Most of people working prevention doesn't have even minimum level of knowledge and skills to work in this field. Unfortunately, still, after uh, many decades of uh, struggling and uh, efforts uh, uh, by us uh, putting in this field, still most of people in prevention doesn't have minimum level of knowledge and, uh, and skills. So we have to focus and, and strengthen this, uh, this part of uh, our work. Uh, Zile also uh, spoke about a culture of uh, prevention. I would add here also culture of evaluation. And I'm not speaking about process evaluation, counting uh, trainings and participants and satisfaction of participants with the training, but outcome evaluation. We have to measure our work. We, we have to realize that without measuring our work, we have no idea how successful we are in prevention. We, we, we can assume or we can think that we are successful after measuring, we can realize the real effects of our work. So we have to incorporate this culture of evaluation in our daily work. So we have to ask ourselves every day, all the time, are we effective? Are we doing something which is effective, which has some outcomes uh, at, at, at the end in our target populations? So extremely important questions as well. 
but nothing is uh, realistic without sustainable funding of evidence-based uh, prevention. In our advocacy work in Slovenia and also at the international level, we try to convince uh, and persuade policy and decision makers to relate funding to evidence-based uh, interventions and standards so that you get the money if your work is based on minimum quality standards. So that should be uh, the main uh, political uh, focus uh, and funding uh, in, in funding schemes uh, at national, international, regional, local level, whatever uh, you think uh, it's important in this field. And then uh, without those, um, uh, those uh, issues discussed and, and uh, advocate, advocated for, we, we, I think we are not able to be successful in this field. So we will struggle all the time, uh, jumping and screaming and uh, convincing, uh, shouting to everybody, but without taking into consideration those issues, I think we have no chance to be successful in, uh, in the future. So that's pretty much uh, all for me from uh, at the beginning, but I can join uh, later on uh, also. Next discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matei. And you lift some very valuable points here in terms of not only measuring the outcome evaluation uh, of our work, but and bringing up funding as well, which are two very much key topics here. I see there are some questions coming in, but I will ask you to bear with me and we will have a Q&A session after our speakers. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Chantal Pepper to, to uh, give your take on this. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having me really, Regina and um, Carlton and the World Federation Against Drugs. Um, I think it's really important to start the conversation that we are currently having, no matter how small. I find over the years, um, you know, by engaging, um, you know, everybody on this level and advocating for it, that is really just the start. And you never know what will happen, you know, emanating from this um, discussion that we're starting now. And it's really critical and there's a big need for prevention science we really put on the platform the same as treatment or harm reduction, for example. It's been really getting some, um, you know, uh, momentum um, even in South Africa. So I'm really here just to give you a practical examples of how whatever all the stuff Dr. Zili and Matish has now mentioned, I am a government official. Um, that has got a big responsibility to implement our national legislation um, that is written by National Department of Social Development in other places called Social Welfare Services. Um, so I have the, the big responsibility to implement national legislation within the Western Cape um, province of South Africa. We've got nine provinces and um, every province is supposed to do this where national legislation is implemented at a provincial and a local level in partnership with our civil society, stakeholders, private, law enforcement, um, justice system, correctional services, um, the National Prosecuting Authority. So we all literally have to come together. And this is what I love what uh, Dr. Zilli said, is that the emphasis is a, it's a multidisciplinary approach um, when it comes to prevention. Um, we can't do it alone as social development. We can't do it alone as the health department. We all have to come together in order to understand our needs, like Dr. Zilli said, and therefore address it accordingly. Because predominantly um, where we have focused um, our interventions on is treatment. There has always been a big demand for treatment, therefore the budgets, where does it go? The treatment. So prevention really has been left on the side, knowingly that, you know, if you prevent something, you know, you would probably not spend as much on the treatment. So I think that is really critical what I've learned even over the years um, in terms of, um, you know, my undergrad as psychology, as my postgrad in diploma and addictions. Um, and in the 10 years that I've been now working in the field, I think prevention um, has always been there, but the evidence-based prevention programs that we are talking about here in this platform has always been a gap. Why? Because we always said we, the, 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 
what everybody understands about prevention currently, it's always about raising awareness about where the services are or, or don't say, just say no. Um, you know, um, those type of ineffective prevention campaigns that really does not work. Um, and I'm really in a very um, privileged position um, because I, because of my undergrad and my postgrad um, and the masters that I'm hoping to uh, complete um, once COVID is um, you know, under control in our country, um, you know, it really teaches us that um, we need to really take prevention more seriously at a provincial level, at a local level, and also funding the organizations and encouraging them to uh, employ and implement um, evidence-based prevention um, programs. So in a nutshell, our National Department of Social Development writes the National Drug Master Plan, which we have to implement at a provincial level and a local level. So my job is to capacitate the municipalities and our funded organizations in terms of you know, the goals that we have to achieve by implementing the National Drug Master Plan. And goal one is really clear. Goal one is uh, reducing demand um, reduction through prevention and treatment of substance use. There in itself it says we have to utilize prevention and it has to be evidence-based. So if you, you can have the best policy, the best legislation, um, uh, you know, that's written within your country set and in your setting, if you don't implement it, then what is the what is the use? So it is my job that I really I feel passionate about it because the municipalities in in the Western Province, the ones that adopt the National Drug Master Plan, um, you know, understands the value of prevention. Um, at a local level. So in my um, couple of years experience now, I feel that, that prevention should be really more lobbied by the decision-making level at the budget holders the level. So really in my field, um, in my position, I feel that it's gaining momentum now. Um, um, the one question the, the, the um, audience, the uh, participant asked about if there's um, any courses, I recently just finished um, um, a media prevention science course where Dr. Zilli also was um, part of um, one of the lecturers um, and she actually um, did the, 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 the prevention science um, initial um, course that we did. Um, and I find those sort of short courses actually extremely helpful because it is my responsibility as the implementer of a national um, you know, policy um, to educate and capacitate myself. And through that, I can understand better on how to educate the, the real the real professionals on the ground um, in order to guide them and support them and encouraging them to use evidence-based prevention programs. And I'm really proud to say that the city of Cape Town, for example, has in fact that um, they did a needs analysis, they did the implementation cycle, like Zalim uh, mentioned earlier. They, uh, they did a needs, a resource assessment, and then they felt that they needed to implement an evidence based prevention program. And they incorporated the strengthening families program that has now been going on for a couple of years now. And they can see, start seeing the, the, the impact within their communities that they are doing. So, as province, in the municipalities, we can work hand in hand together to really, and this is why I say, people like myself that are in the positions within government, we need to get educated on what best practices are so that we can encourage and guide and support the municipalities to do the right thing in partnership with our funded organizations. So it really is juggling a lot. Um, all the time, especially for people like myself in this in this position, um, you know, it is challenging, but it is doable because if once we strengthen the network, um, you'll see everything starts um, connecting. Like for example, Dr. Zilli now, we are, I'm working now with her um, and through her work, I understand prevention science better. And now I can assist the people on the ground with the right information. And I think once you have someone, um, you know, like myself in positions in other um, provinces or states, um, I think 
flow of information, um, you know, about prevention science, evidence-based prevention science will become easier. Um, and it is a constant back and forth. Um, you know, it's not, it's ne it will never be easy. It will never go away. But as long as we have the foundations now that Dr. Zille and all the amazing um, professionals that has, uh, has, has worked tirelessly over the years, in 20 years, um, that it is, is now the time to really lobby for prevention, um, evidence-based prevention programs within all our settings. And it is possible, um, participants, to really work together in all fields. You really just have to, my advice to all the municipalities when they start a um, implementation cycle or the local drug action committees is always work with those who want to work with you because the rest will just waste your time and you'll get frustrated and you just feel like you're not gaining any ground. Um, so that's just the one example that I'd like to share um, with participants. Um, and I know South Africa is a developing country. We do have a lot of infrastructure in place, but where our problem areas are, where we're really struggling, um, you know, our marginalized communities. So culture, the past, everything is interlinked, like um, Dr. Zilli said, with the risk. We have to identify the risk in and really understand, um, you know, evidence-based programs that you implement in schools as well. Education has to be on board, which is a critical component in terms of um, prevention work that we have to do all in all settings, in all countries. Um, and I think, you know, that is really why I say prevention has, is becoming, for me, a critical component that we really need to encourage, um, you know, everybody from the leadership, political leadership, right down to the social workers, they, we all need to be on the same page. Um, and that is my cue. I'd like to say thank you so much again for this opportunity. I really see this is the beginning um, of, of greater things to come. And I'm really proud to be part of this panel and Dr. Zilli leading the team as well. So thank you so much, Carlton as well, for initiating this webinar series. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Chantel, and thank you for making sure that we all know that we need to take prevention more seriously and show cap showcasing the sort of capacitating municipalities and organizations in a multidisciplinary approach. And we cannot do it alone, which leads us perfectly into Carlton's <laughs> uh, input for today's session. So Carlton, over to you. Regina, thank you so very, very much. And, and let me just share with everyone, um, I, I, Everyone on the screen uh, that you are seeing are heroes of mine. I am, an, I am just thrilled uh, to be able to have the opportunity of sharing uh, this time with, with, with them. Um, Dr. Zilli, thank you so, so, so very, very, very much uh, for being, for your friendship, uh, as well as for um, an extraordinary presentation. Uh, you have altered the way I look at prevention and you altered the way I think about this. And, and so I only wanna introduce two ideas based based upon what Mataj has said and Chantel has said and what Zilli has said, um, to just provoke a bit of conversation that I hope we might be able to get into and to engage folks in conversations. Um, uh, Dr. Zilli, you um, introduced this notion to me um, a good while ago around the importance of understanding vulnerability that you brought up today. And in the context of that, that happened to coincide at the exact same time as I became um, a grandparent for the first time in my life, right? And so I visit my children uh, to visit my grandchildren, um, which is the most extraordinary thing in my life. Uh, but when I go into their homes, I find that they have altered the entire environment uh, that is no longer conducive conducive to me. So for example, when I try to go down the stairs in their homes, I can't open up this grate that they have in front of the stairs, right? And when I actually try to open up cabinets to get a snack, there's all these locks and, and they, they have these childproof areas where they, where they, where you can't even plug in your, your phone to charge in. And, and so so what that suggested to me is that I was not the priority in that environment. They prioritized the most vulnerable population in that environment. And in the context of understanding that, I really became fascinated by two critical ideas that I've been trying to talk about across the country and anywhere 
we've had the opportunity to speak. And that is the notion of the relationship of prevention in identifying the most vulnerable within our populations. And secondly, prioritizing where they are most vulnerable. In other words, what are those environments in which they become most vulnerable across the lifespan? Uh, and this notion of making prevention obvious is something that I think is critical to the work that we are all doing. So I want to share just a just a couple of ideas. I I have just two uh, big two slides that I want to share just to anchor this idea here, and that is that Dr. Zilli spoke to us a great deal about the science of prevention and the application. And this is something that we've all been familiar with for a good, good while. Understanding these notions is critical, but I should suggest that what we have focused on a great deal are those first three steps quite a bit. And what Dr. Zilli was really bringing to us is the notion of expanding upon that and building upon that to ensure widespread adoption of this work. And this is part of what Matish has also kind of begun to spoke about and Chantella spoke about in her fashion. And I think that there are some critical things that we need to think about in prevention as we are attempting to engage folks. I, I, I am, I've, I've, you know, I kind of assumed and acquired a phrase that Dr. Martin Luther King began to share uh, around what he referred to as mass direct action. I'm reframing as mass strategic participation in prevention. In order to be able to do that, I think we have to do four things. I think we have to begin to help our folks translate and clarify this thing called the science of prevention so that they might be able to prioritize better. I think we need to help our communities engage, as Chantel has mentioned, at the grassroots level and also at the legislative level, level but to focus locally, uh, which means that we have to concretize how we are employing prevention science. Thirdly, I think we need to be able to help our communities define what their strategic leverage is in order to actually move the needle in terms of the things and the types of behaviors they're trying to uh, um, um, suggest, uh, and that is to strategize, right? And so we inform the workforce by helping them to strategize. And then most importantly, I think we have to begin to share with folks that it has to go beyond risk factors, protective factors, and all these things, uh, all these frameworks. And we have to be able to engage effectively beyond those that we are currently involved with. Um, in the United States, I'm fortunate to be able to co-partner with a number of organizations called Prevention Technology Transfer Centers. In fact, there are some representatives uh, that I know are, are participating in this webinar, and I'm so happy to be able to see my colleague Kristen Kidd uh, from the Southeast Prevention Technology Center uh, and David Clausen from the Mid-America Prevention Technology Tra Transfer Center. And the goal of the transfer centers in the United States is to take the ideas that Mateo has identified, the ideas that Chantel has identified, and provide resources across the country. Um, and uh, there are um, prevention technology transfer centers, addiction technology transfer centers, and mental health technology transfer centers in each of the 10 regions uh, that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has defined across our country. They are extraordinary resources, and it's just one example of how we and our nation are attempting to take the science that Dr. Zilli has spoken about and help to translate that uh, to tools and resources and practical applications across the nation um, with the help and the hope of making sure that we're able to reduce the impact of substance misuse in our nation. And so I think I wanted to just introduce the fact that these technology transfer ideas have also now just begun to look at how they might be able to have an impact internationally. So now there are international technology transfer centers that I think many of our participants can become aware of. And so I just want to introduce those ideas and then 
um, begin the conversation with, with our panel. Um, Matej offers some extraordinary, uh, provocative um, um, questions and ideas that I think we can begin to get into. And I would love to hear Zilly's um, response to some of the questions that uh, have been posed. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Regina, uh, to take us into this. Thank you so much, Carlton. It's always a pleasure to hear you uh, present and thank you for being with us today and not only today, but in the process of planning for this fantastic series. Uh, I agree with you. I also want to hear the answers to some of these questions and we have received some in the Q&A box and some in the chat box. So I'll do my best to ensure that we have all of them answered. Um, I reckon we can start with one from the chat box because the Q&A we can all see here and you can perhaps decide yourselves which one you would like to answer live. You can either press the answer live button or just sort of wave to me. But let's begin with the first question. The and wave. this is the wave. <laughs> let's do the wave. <laughs> we can begin with the question from Lena Harake, who, who asks uh, how to strengthen cooperation in multidisciplinary approaches. One stakeholder has seldom a holistic responsibility. People consist of, very, of many different needs. Who would like to begin? Perhaps Dr. Silly, I can force you to, <laughs> to begin to answer this. That's a, one of the challenges, of course, is, is, uh, is bringing people together uh, yeah. from different disciplines. Um, I guess one of the things, core issues that I've noticed, I, this is more experiential than it is I don't know, research, um, sharing a, com you know, they have to have a common goal, common objective. Um, and and uh, I don't know. It's it's been very hard. You, you, we all know there are people who are view the world this way, and then there there's a, you have to find the people who view it this way, I guess, um, to bring them to the table. And and they're there. It's it's identifying them and find them, and uh, uh, that can be done through uh, professional associations, it's through conferences, it's sitting down and chatting with people. Um, I think I, I think that's really a, a I don't you know there's there's no like listing um, that we can go to to that Carlton you you had you look like you have a response to I, I would I'm, I'm going to defer to Chantel because I saw that she 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 had a reply as well and then I'll add to what Chantel offered. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, look in in South Africa, there's been provision has been made in our act. Um, a step is specifically dedicated to um, the provincial substance abuse forums and the local drug action committees. So there in our legislation, it says that we have to work together. Um, so it has made provision and how we actually communicate that um, at forum and a local level is my job is so difficult. Yesterday I had a workshop with one of the municipalities and one of the um, key objectives or the barriers that they always like to, to you know, uh, throw in my face is that they say municipalities in the constitution, schedule four or five, um, you know, is they not supposed to be delivering social services or is looking at those sort of um, issues. You know, that was the first question, like that was the first statement that I had to now um, take it. Okay, what do I deal with this? How do I, how do I deal with it? I um, mean, how do I convince a municipal manager who has the budget um, and the power in order to, to make a difference um, and working together with the municipality? So those sort of questions I always get asked. But if, the if, your, if your legislation doesn't make provision for that, and unfortunately, you will have a tough time bringing all the role, right role players together. Because so our act actually makes it very clear for everybody. It actually outlines who needs to be part of the committee from a municipal level right to a provincial level. So if your legislation is there, who is um, implementing your legislation? And that's another barrier that you know um, countries might face. Um, so they're not as lucky um, as, you know, if, like let's say myself, who has experience, who is uh, qualified in um, the field as well. And that also, might, you must remember, a lot of the um, government um, officials, they might be social work degrees, but they don't necessarily have, um, um, you know, the, the expertise and the specialists in, 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 in substance use disorder. So they, again, also have those sort of barriers to overcome. Um, so the legislation should be there. Um, if it isn't there, 
And that is also another big barrier. And indicators in the different departments in the annual performance plans is non-existent in most of our departments. But that too is another barrier. Thank you. There is a mixture in the U.S. of going um, from grass tops to grass bottoms approach towards towards doing this. I think there is an important um, um, need for those of us who are within this field to really understand how important it is for us to begin to clarify exactly what is the goal, what is the objective of what it is that we're doing, and ensuring that as we are reaching out to these various sectors, that everybody plays a role, plays a specific role. Not everyone is intended to do the same thing, and even even though we're applying the same tools, the way we apply those tools has to be geared toward the local context and settings uh, that and the culture, as Dr. Zilli spoke to us about um, around that. And so really identifying how we uh, play a critical role in helping folks to translate and see that they have a role to play in this thing that we're referring to as prevention science. And we have to do a better job of that. Uh, and I see Matej, and then there are a number of other comments that I want to make sure that we're able to get to. Yeah, I have very short comment, maybe. Sometimes in practice, it's important to uh, to bring it to the lowest level. So for wow. example, multidisciplinary yes. or multi-sectoral approach it's very easy to explain. For example, if we have children or child with mental health issues and uh, early criminality activities, etc., if we bring together at the same table, social counselor, social health center, and maybe police as well, they can solve problem much easier than each of them uh, alone. Right. That's the point. So bringing them together, sometimes uh, it's uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's enough to bring them together. So they sit together and discuss how to solve uh, the problem. So that's the, the main point I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to some of the questions in the Q&A box here. Uh, I wonder if we can put two of these together. It's from the same person. The first question is, how do you balance the system in ensuring a coherent prevention strategy? And then to add them, how do we measure and review effectiveness of the intervention policies? That's a zilly question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I have to unmute myself. Um, uh, let me take the second one uh, first. <laughs> um, uh, when, I, when you're talking about uh, um, policies rather than programs or, or as a strategy, um, it, yeah, it's a really good question because when we were reviewing that literature for the international standards, um, that you can't randomize community. Well, you can actually, but um, it's more difficult to, to test out policies. Uh, and there was a debate about what's the most effective evaluation or research method to use. And um, there's time series analyses um, have been demonstrated to be very effective in looking at policies. And there's a, a good deal of literature on, uh, for instance, tobacco policies, um, about availability, accessibility of tobacco policies. There's also a great literature showing the different, how effective that methodology is for, um, um, uh, drinking and driving. Um, so, so I, I think, I don't know if that's the, the, what the intent of the question was. Um, the first, first part of that, the first part of that question, I really, um, think the group has more experience than I in, in, in responding to that. So, um, if you want to repeat that question, um, perhaps they can jump in. Thank you. Uh, I will repeat it. Uh, how do you balance the system in ensuring a coherent prevention strategy? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Because uh, when we go to communities uh, to start discussing how to develop prevention strategy at local level, uh, the people from municipality, they think they can do do it by themselves. So to sit together with uh, politicians at local level, and maybe they would invite principal of the school and maybe director of social services. But then we gave them a, we give them a list of 
at least 20 or 30 stakeholders at the local level who could be relevant for discussions. Also religious organizations, sport clubs, culture clubs, music schools, whatever you can imagine, all those who participate in socialization of our children and adolescents, or also parents as well. So we are also uh, in a socialization process all the time. So all those uh, institutions are relevant and important uh, to, to bring them together. And uh, then it's always a matter of motivation. If those who are more motivated, they will get more work to do. So they will ha have a more objectives, more activities, uh, more responsibility. Uh, and that's a, always a matter of discussion and division of tasks and motivation of people. Uh, so it's not an easy task to, to bring together a balanced uh, strategy with everybody equally involved in the process. So, but it's important to start. It's important to start maybe with three, four stakeholders who are motivated enough to do it. And then others will see results and they will come uh, uh, later on and support and uh, with their own activities and uh, ideas. So it's, this is a process. Prevention is always a process. So it's not, you know, we will set up a strategy, everybody will do equally everything and it, we will have a perfect result. So this is not uh, real. So it's a, it's a process and uh, a matter of motivation uh, in most of the cases. Zilly first and then Chantel. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, Matish, for, 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 for saying that. And I've been hesitant to step in here because um, I think I think if you look at my chart of the national prevention system, the, the basic ingredient, the, the element, the basic element is the community and however that's defined. And I think you said it really well, Matisha. We do we know how to do that. We have a, a number of experiences uh, with uh Go, you know, in terms of uh, a community of care model, the Prosper model, CADCA model, there are models that are effective, have been demonstrated to be effective. It's not an easy process, as you're pointing out, but um, to me, that's the what's the basic basic unit that we have to look at. And every community has a different substance use problem. It has a whole different vulnerability. Uh, issues to address. Some of them may be more obvious than others. So yeah, I think that's the the, the element that we have to start with. And, and thank you for giving me that opportunity because I, I wanted to say that earlier and I didn't have a chance to. Thank you. Chantal? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add on to what my colleagues also just said. It really is just that. It's um, establishing a co like a, a committee at a local level. So in our case, it would be the municipalities that have to do this. They have to drive it, they have to appoint an official to, a drive, to, to establish the committee who's got all the role players like Matesh has mentioned, from law enforcement right down to the schools, um, and then they come together. So that's really the first phase. Um, and you'll be surprised how long that actually can take. Anything from a month right through to six months, because the municipalities always feel overwhelmed. That, you know, they're not specialists in this field. So bringing the right stakeholders on that committee, which we call local drug action committees, is really the first step getting all the right role players together. And you're quite right, Matish, the, the police, um, yeah, but us, they love to do prevention, not a prevention, awareness raisings at schools. Going in, you know, going to the schools and this is what we've done and da 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 da, -da and you must say no and da 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 da. So getting the understanding of like how to change it, but also giving them support and guidance, that's the first step. So when the municipalities have that established committee with all the relevant stakeholders, it becomes easier to draw up your strategy, um, you know, to address your alcohol and drug um, problems within your communities. And that can range from prevention right through to treatment, right through to aftercare. So it's the continuum of care um, that in the end of the day um, will really show that's an impact. And of course, like Zilli said, the needs assessment um, is key. You cannot do any action plan without a needs assessment first, because every municipality, every um, 
grassroots levels is very different and they have different resources and different budgets. I think that's also very key to remember. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chantelle. And I'll move on to the next question. And then I also, or we also have a very good sort of final question in the chat looking more forward. But before yeah. that, uh, let's ask the question, young people don't like being told to say no to drugs. How effective are advocacy programs in prevention strategies? And it's a little bit what you're going at there, Chantelle. So perhaps you'd like to begin. No. <laughs> I was going to say, Dr. Zili um, really explains it very well. Um, so I think perhaps I'll give her the, the platform to, to, to highlight that about the youth and the evidence-based prevention programs designed for the youth specifically. Um, there, there's, there isn't a lot of research to support these approaches. Um, and... Um, I think that there are ways of involving young people in prevention programs that are that prevention programs that have demonstrated effectiveness, uh, and, and I think you need to look for those. Matej, yeah, I, I'm pretty often uh, uh, involved in such discussions when people uh, come to me and. Uh, uh, they're angry on me because I said that they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I always say, uh, look, guys, science is not on your side. So take some time and look to some other directions. Uh, there are ways, uh, a lot of different ways to, to implement some evidence-based practices. So don't stick with your 30 years ineffective work. Improve things and look to other directions as well. So my, uh, my um, statement is always, uh, sorry guys, science is not on your side. So. There, that, however, there are programs that do involve young people. And um, so it's not that all these evidence-based right. programs don't involve young people, but they have specific yeah. roles. Uh, in, in fact, the, the, uh, there's, there's, a, there's suicide programs that uh, use peer leaders um, their uh, their student assistance programs that um, use peers in the school, but they're trained and they work with adults, right. and that, that's that's really important. Uh, and they have clear roles, and, it, and so I, I we should be so dismissive, but we we know I know exactly the kinds of programs you're talking about, Mitch. Um, you know, it's how the kids come in, and and also I think you know one a st pretty strong policy in schools, for instance, is school policies about substance use. Um, and having youth involved in, in, in that, that process, I think is really important. To have school, children involved in, in schools in decision-making roles, I yeah. think helps them bond mm -hmm. to the school. So, but they have to be within <laughs> the right context. Yeah, we, 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 understand a number, we understand a number of things that re are required in order to make sure that we're engaging young people well and effectively, uh, regardless of what the pro program is or the opportunity it m what would happen to be. Um, I, I would like to, to offer a bit of a shift on the question itself and suggest that a in, in the United States, um, uh, I can speak about um, concretely, uh, that uh, all the data suggests that there are far more numbers of young people who are not participating in the negative behaviors than there are those that are, are um, in, um, participating and exhibiting these negative behaviors. And so the notion to me is that there is this great opportunity to engage young people to help us to spread the word of prevention and prevention science. Um, and they are often much better communicators than any of us. Uh, and, and particularly during and in, in these times in which um, um, young people are engaged uh, um, digitally um, in all kinds of ways and methods that I am completely unfamiliar with, uh, I would su simply suggest that if you don't know how or what the next or the latest TikTok dance is, we may not be the right people to spread the message to this current generation. So we have to engage young people in, in, in a phrase that I, I, I like to utilize um, as prevention influencers, if you will, to make sure and put them at the lead, allow them to take 
the tools and the science that we have, uh, but share them in ways and methods that are completely engaging. And that may not exactly get to the question that you have, but I think that it's important for us to think about ways in which we might be able to, to have young people partner with us in spreading the method messages of prevention. And there are a number of organizations that are doing that particularly well. Actually, I'm trying. I, I started an outline for a book for high school students on prevention science. <laughs> <laughs> we are thinking a light. <laughs> Very good. It's wonderful, and and we have a lot of fantastic members as well that work particularly on engaging yes. young people. And you can keep an eye out for what WFAD is partnering with Fourth Wave Foundation, for instance, in the upcoming uh, few months in engaging young people. Uh, we did receive uh, the perfect end to a great webinar uh, question here, comments leading into a question. And this is from uh, Craig, who says, I was struck by Matej's, Matej's comment about building bridges between research and practice, and that bridge isn't built yet. I feel the same way. After many years working on linking practice with research, there feels like it's been limited success. So the question for our panel is, what does our panel think is missing? What can we do to increase these connections and better ensure prevention science is being used by people wanting to do prevention? I will give each of you a crack at this and we will begin with Mate. <laughs> uh, am I uh, muted? No, you no, can't. We can, we can uh, hear you. Something appears on my screen, so <laughs> okay. technology. I'm also too old uh, already for this new technology. <laughs> um, you know, uh, maybe it's not a um, 100% correct uh, answer, but I think advocacy is one of the, the keys, the most important keys. And also when I started to work in the field of prevention, I thought that if I would bring all the evidence to the politicians or policymakers table, they will say, oh, yeah, we will do it immediately. But after a very short time, I realized that it doesn't work like this. So then I started to think about advocacy. And one of the biggest successes we have here in Slovenia, that we actually uh, multiplied uh, number of advocates, especially among young people. That's why we have one of the strictest tobacco legislation in Slovenia. That's why we are improving a li little by little our alcohol policy and also cannabis policy. It's almost impossible for legalization groups in Slovenia to put this topic on political agenda because of us, because we are stopping this all the time. And politicians know uh, about uh, what we are going to do if they start discussing this, like a media boom and, and et cetera. So, Advocacy is really important key, especially in the field of, of politics, and also to put some key points in the field of prevention higher on the political agenda. And it, it, it is very important that we start as early as possible in the policy cycle. We usually jump into this advocacy work in the field of, uh, in, in the phase of um, adoption or implementation sometimes which is uh, absolutely too late. And there is a big opportunity for us to start working on agenda setting phase, like uh, bringing uh, to this, um, uh, to the agenda of politicians before elections, for example, when they develop uh, pre-election programs, when they started to make promises to voters, then there is a time for us to bring some of those topics on the agenda. So they promised to the voters that they will strengthen the alcohol or tobacco policy or put more investment in prevention, evidence-based prevention. And then we can always ask them, when are you going to do this? When they are in the government? So I think those are important, I think important issues and questions uh, about um, uh, the potential success in the future uh, for prevention science. I was too long, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it was perfect. I'm just trying to see if anybody's making 
a wave. I see Dr. Silly has yeah, unmuted I, herself. I, I think that's, you know, thank you for, Mantish for doing that. And thank you, Craig, for that question. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, actually Craig is doing it. He's training yeah. prevention professionals in the state of Utah yeah. in uh, prevention, prevention science. And I think that obviously this is a, we have to do this at multiple levels. But I think if we had the, if we say prevention professionals are professional, the field is a profession, and the universities embrace that and offer degrees in it, I think that's, that validates, it validates um, the field. Um, if you, you know, I, I've been looking at this whole issue of professionalization, I looked at medicine, the history of medicine, it took 2,000 years <laughs> for medicine to be acknowledged as a profession. Hopefully we can speed that process up a bit. Maybe in our lifetime we can see it. But, uh, uh, I, you know, I, it's not an easy task and it, it's multifaceted. So that bridge um, has to have, it's a long bridge, I suspect, and it has to have, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but it has to have a lot of pieces, trestle, trestles in place. Uh, to, to keep it strengthened. And I, I do think another thing is a group of us are working on um, a white paper on normalization. It sort of builds on, if those of you who are familiar with uh, Dennis Embry and Tony Biglin's idea of kernels, is sort of how do we bring this information to, to the general public? I think if we, tr if we had a program for parents, um, you know, this is really important for you to have better lives for your kids to, you know, recognize the field of prevention um, to bring it into the schools, for instance. Um, you know, I think there's so many different parts to this puzzle that we have to, to solve. Definitely. Chantal, would you like to add something? No, I think um, the colleagues uh, covered everything, but uh, just to reiterate, it, it really is um, a multidisciplinary approach, but uh, Putting it into universities, tertiary education really is key, um, especially, um, you know, we have developed a curriculum for addiction um, at two of our top universities in South Africa, University of Cape Town, as well as Stellenbosch University. Um, that has changed my world because I did it about um, nine years ago. And without that, I don't think I would be where I am today. So we did do cover prevention in that um, a postgrad diploma, um, but I think it's like Dr. Zilli said, and my question, we have to get it um, as, you know, as a, as, a, as, a as a master's degree or an honors degree or some sort of um, specialist degree, like how social work has a clinical social work comp component, and that will fall under the honors degree. So I really think that is definitely, but I really want to end it off on a positive note. I think from now compared to five years ago, we've yeah, really yeah. come very far. And I think we are heading in the right direction because now we are really um, gaining momentum. And I really just feel positive for the future in terms of prevention, um, but always target leaders, never give up on the leadership. And as government, um, you know, um, we have got so much red tape and protocol um, that we also have to adhere to. So just be patient with government, but also just know that um, find that right person to work with and you can do wonders at a provincial, national or a local level. So great work, Matish and Dr. Zili and Carlton and Regina. I really feel proud to be part of this groundbreaking, um, you know, prevention science webinar series. So thank you. Chantel, thank you so very, very much. And and uh, I'll just uh, share uh, my last thought and 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 turn it back over. Uh, one, I'm, I'm, I'm extraordinarily thrilled, extraordinarily thrilled. Um, uh, by the conversation that we've been able to have and the participation of those who joined us uh, for for this for this time, I know uh, many of the leaders that chosen chose uh, to use their time to be with us, and so I'm really gratified by that. I, I in the work that I've done for the last 25 plus years uh, in this field, um, what I found is that there are that prevention is more even more than a science. Prevention is a craft. Uh, prevention is something that we can get better at, and we're all getting better at it. And I think there are four areas that might help us to move even closer to what Craig has has put forward. I, again, um, this is what I, I've discovered. I think we got to 
do better at translating and clarifying our role. I think we have to do better at helping folks uh, in communities um, to focus locally uh, on what is going on for them and how this relates to their setting. I think we have to do a better job of helping folks define what their strategic leverage will happen to be. The strategic leverage in Mombasa is going to be very different from the strategic leverage in Brussels, for example, or in Utah. Right? And then lastly, we have to make sure that we put a greater emphasis in expanded beyond the usual suspects that typically come to these kind of conversations and how do we reach beyond ourselves and engage the broader population in this conversation of change that they are directly relevant to and related to. Uh, and so those are the ways that I think we move for further, uh, Craig, and what it is that you have to offer. And we have four more sessions that Regina, I'm sure, is going to share and talk to us about. The, the best of the best is coming to join us, folks. So come on, please come back and bring your friends to this. Thank you so very, very much. And my great love and appreciation to all that participated. And so back to you, Regina. Thank you so much, Carlton. It's always great to have you end with uh, some closing words. I couldn't have possibly done it better myself. So I will leave us here with this uh, flyer for our upcoming webinars. As you can see, it's once every two weeks and on different topics within the great field of prevention. And I hope that you can all join us. You can, we will send out a registration link with the follow-up uh, together with a recording of this uh, fantastic webinar that we've had today. So thank you again uh, on behalf of Carlton Hall Consulting LLC and WFAD, thank you for being with us today, uh, for sharing your knowledge and expertise, uh, for sharing your comments and questions in the chat box and to our fantastic speakers today. Hope to see you all again very soon, in two weeks to be exact. So thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.